I would like to introduce our next speaker, Luis Rojo de Castro. He is a professor at, at, at San Madrid, uh, the Escuela Tecnica Superior de Arquitectura in Madrid, Spain. And he was going to take us, if Marilisa took us to this embodied experience and the individual experience, he's going to take us to um, the experience of landscape. I would like to briefly just introduce him. Um, he's a teacher at ETSAM from where he graduated as well. And he has been also a visiting teacher at the Harvard GSD, for example, and also at the Bernard and Anne Spitzer School of Architecture. He also is an art practicing architect. He has a studio called Rojo Fernandez Shaw. And uh, he also has been, an, has, is, continues to be an editor. So a practice that ranges from architecture to teaching, writing, and critique. Welcome, Luis, to our, uh, to our conference today. And without further ado, I would uh, pass on the word to you. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, for being here today uh, to the school, uh, to the organizer, to Roberto and to Vera. I have to tell um, uh, mm, I have to say that Mike, I always enjoy Assassin's Creed background. So you have one follower, um, uh, Elisa Navarro. Uh, I was the only one looking at the background, but uh, my kids were killing all around. But I really enjoy the the, the backgrounds and the historical uh, atmosphere. Well, in any event, um, well, what I'm going to present today it's a uh, uh, um, it's part of. Uh, let me share the screen and and start with it. Uh, well, I'm going to. Uh, Present today is part of a larger and more comprehensive research project I'm working on at the Architecture Master Program in Madrid, the School of Architecture, which is a project focused on architecture as media. So uh, answering to the colloquium brief uh, in regard to the alternative concept uh, of heritage or critical approach to heritage, what I will try to do is to expand the uh, to expand the notion of heritage by arguing that nature uh, is a physical reality that I would argue belongs to the past, a sort of legacy and memory, a reality that uh, as modern beings we have never encountered uh, and that we know just indirectly, always through mediating constructions, representations and descriptions. So this process of distancing ourselves from nature or detaching ourselves from our, our natural identity to become, in order to become modern beings have been supported in a series of very significant mediations. The representation of nature as landscape would be just the first one, as it also implies to place ourselves outside it, overlooking it as a panorama. It was the first step to objectify nature, to turn it into a single comprehensive image, uh, we could look at and to begin to establish a fundamental modern difference between the human and the natural. But more significant would be the distinct attempts to construct the natural as an idea, as an abstract model or as an analog. Among them, the pervasive paradigm of uh, organicism. However, different in the pedigree, these attempts share in common the transformation of the natural into cultural constructions, into another human artifact. These constructions on the notions of nature according to different cultural and historical ideas is what I would like to talk about uh, today. It is well accepted that landscape in Europe, and this is, this is gonna be a little bit of an Eurocentric lecture, uh, as a concept as well as a design instrument is a cultural category produced in the late 1650s or early 1700s. Depending on both the complex division of labor in developed economies like England or Holland, sorry, and a new painting genre. Nature was reconfigured by this genre into a prospect, the background of figures and buildings that inhabited the new uh, urban world. Filtered through the idealized aesthetics of classicism, the case of Poussin or Lorraine in the uh, uh, mid 1700s, later absorbed within the new industrious mercantile capitalism and portrayed 
uh, as it was actually being transformed at the time, not anymore the expression of classical narratives, but as a resource, an economic instrument, as a e human environment. This is the, the one before was a landscape by a uh, constable of England. This is um, by Van Goyen uh, of the uh, Lake of Harlem in the uh, mid 1600s. Uh, but finally, this uh, natural condition uh, was confronted with a much more interesting, much more demanding uh, uh, scene, which was the newness of the new world uh, and its human nature. Uh, this is a painting by uh, Adrian Beckman of the uh, Dutch colony the new in, in New India, uh, which shows a complete different scene, even though it has been uh, portrayed with the same uh, pictorial uh, devices. You can see the palm trees, you can see the different peoples, you can see the uh, different environment. So by the end of the 1700, nature had been absorbed by culture and had become a sort of commodity, an aesthetic commodity as well as a physical commodity. However, all these trends in European landscape painting share in common the familiarity with every one of the natural scenes portrayed. By the 1750s, European landscapes were not only familiar, they were historical in themselves. Known and familiar natures absorbed by social customs, by local traditions, by national identities. So we can talk, we could talk of uh, Italian Campania, the Swiss landscape, the Dutch lowlands, the woods of England. And as such, all these landscapes, all these natures were transformed into pictorial and mental images. So when in the late 1790s, the naturalist Alexander von Humboldt arrived at the Spanish colonies of the Nueva España, what he encountered was a reality unknown to him as a Westerner. That of a wild nature, a savage land, as he was called, not without these parts. Humboldt accounts on the tropical forests and the volcanic mountains of Central and South America belong to what has been called natural history, performed by the natural scientists and the so-called naturalists. The role was to translate an unknown natural reality and its exuberant variety into words, to transcribe it into descriptions and books, and in the particular case of Humboldt, also into drawings. It is important to remember that engagement of a so-called naturalist, the natural scientist, with the natural environment happened through physical exploration, observation, collection, description, organization, but most importantly, through classification and terminology, by the transcript of nature, of the natural environment, into this artificial system, this coding of words and terminology. In the words of Humboldt, in one of his uh, famous books, Views on Nature from 1808, individual fragments were recorded at the place and time, and only later forged together as a whole. This aesthetic treatment, treatment of matters of natural history despite the wonderful power and flexibility of the language of our native land, German or French in his case as well, carries with it a tremendous difficulty of composition. So the difficulty of composition, which is an aesthetic uh, impulse, is to translate nature through language. On the one hand, there was the taxonomical approach embodied by Carlo Linneo, system of classification of all the living creatures. The, what Linneo called the Sistema Natura in Latin, natural system, was published in 1735, was constructed as a catalog of all natural things known at the time. Not even more, not even less, all natural things. Humboldt's approach, on the contrary, was quite different. He rejected the taxonomical description in favor of a unified model of nature, a model that would explain not only what the natural world was made of, but most importantly, how did it work? Thus, he was the first to describe nature as a complex mechanism in subtle balance, as a unified environment, or should we say, as an organism. Taxonomy was substituted by what he referred to as types. In his first, uh, fifth chapter of the 1808 book, that I was making reference to before, 
and the, in the chapter under the title Ideas for a Physiognomy of Plant, he writes, quote, the old and profound power of, of organization, despite certain liberty in the abnormal development of the specific, specific cases, binds all animals and vegetable life forms to a firm, perpetually returning type. So Humboldt in the uh, early 1880s uh, was uh, using the same concept that Quatremé de Quincy would use in the 1825 dictionary on uh, historic uh, architecture uh, soon after. You know? So when this is Humboldt and his uh, uh, fellow companion Bonplan uh, at the uh, uh, bottom of the Chimborazo volcan, volcano, uh, right before uh, going up it. And uh, these are some of the drawings uh, Humboldt made uh, uh, of this trip that we will, we will look at uh, later. So when Humboldt had to decide on how to draw this new natural reality that he encountered in the new world, he opted for an image of it as a whole, as opposed to the dismembered catalog of the taxonomist. And expectedly, Humboldt decided to portray this nature not as a prospect nor in a chart, but as an imaginary section of an imaginary scale. Described, he described it as an artifact in a scale, a miraculous mechanical device, like a miraculous mechanical device whose components and laws were being exposed. And he also decided to do it in section because it was not a pictorial image, but a descriptive diagram that had to be both looked at and read through simultaneously. You can see the series of drawings that he made. This is one of the first in which he decided already to combine text and images and drawings. You can see those the writing on the left hand side are all the, na the names of all the plants at the different heights uh, of, the, uh, of the mountain that they encountered. Later, he went on to this one, which is like an elevation with all the uh, different uh, ecosystem and the, diff uh, the different heights of the uh, elevations of the, uh, of the mountain. And this is the final chart, which is the most famous one, the most probably the most complete and beautiful one called the physical tableau of the equatorial, equatorial regions containing his essay uh, on the geography of plants from 1808. And you can see that, as I was saying before, this is both an image and a text. You can see it even further here when it becomes more complex with all the data on both sides and the bottom. Uh, but also it's difficult to say whether it's an image or perspective, perspectival image. It's already an elevation and a section and it's basically uh, uh, a diagram in which uh, the um, scale and the, uh, uh, the mode of projection has been very carefully manipulated to be extremely descriptive and, and at the same time to keep the appearance of, of, uh, of the mountain. This one system, the model of a unified natural environment the stretch across the latitudes from the tropic towards the poles in the same way that it stretch in altitude from the west forest, the wet forest of the Orinoco at the bottom of the drawing to the frozen crater of the Chimborazo 6,000 6, meters above uh, on the top of the drawing. Unity across the planet was reinforced through the, these two concepts, type and physiognomy. Both are formal analytical devices but at the same time, there are abstract principles that also guided architecture theory at the time. But description and classification, the epistemological tools of natural scientists were also modes of possession. Not only possession of knowledge, but possession of the natural environment per se. Making use of the descriptions produced by the explorer and naturalist, the natural environment was artificially reproduced back in the metropolis, constructed not just as science or scientific experiments, but as deliberate acts of appropriation. 
The modern subject gained the capacity to construct natural environments, a fragment of nature extracted from its regional location and, the reconst and reconstructed as a climate prototype. So this is a map made by Humboldt or after Humboldt's research on the uh, continuity of climatic conditions or ecological and climatic conditions across the world, the entire world, right? describing nature as an organism, as a continuous system that uh, stretches across the world and up to different altitudes as well, that uh, was, be, that was uh, spread throughout books and uh, other types of uh, uh, media, like drawings in, in the early 1800s, and turned into a very uh, uh, interesting knowledge, a very useful knowledge for other purposes as well. So as I was saying, uh, making use of these uh, uh, knowledge, the artificial, the natural environments were artificially reproduced back in the metropolis. This is, for example, the great conservatory at Chatsworth House in Devonshire, built by Baxton and Decimus Barton in 1836. So the modern subject gained the capacity to construct the natural environment, a fragment of nature extracted from its regional location and reconstructed as a climate prototype. In the project for the reproduction of the different environments, architecture became a necessary media. And the overlap between botany, the literal dimensions of plants, and the environmental conditions of tropical climate fostered the opportunity for inventing a new kind of building, the botanical machines, of which this at Chatsworth is a very fine example. You can see here how it was uh, built uh, the cast iron and laminated wood uh, supported uh, supporting system created a rich and fair roof that would be at right angles in the morning and afternoon uh, light for the maximum uh, uh, exposure and the uh, uh, better climate conditions inside. These botanical machines were straightforward and yet very ingenious in their instrumental conception and design of the structure of the glass enclosure and the technological production and control of indoors and artificial atmosphere. And due to the radical programmatic requirements to rehearse the natural environment out of its original natural context, they invented not only a type, but the kind of architecture that embodied the formation a literal disorder of the natural order identified by Humboldt, by Humboldt. The British crown and its mercantile expansion in the colonies of the empire had been gathering at Kew Gardens, plant species brought, brought by naturalists, entrepreneurs and civil servants from Asia, as well as from Africa and Americans in the 1770s. But the tropical and equatorial species had enormous difficulties for surviving. Both the trip back on board to England, as well as the failures uh, in the reproduction of these species in the new latitudes. However, hum Humboldt's observations of model and models proved very enlightening. And when he referred to the interconnect interconnectedness of natural forces and described it with precise ob observation and measurements in different environmental systems, he actually initiated a process of uh, 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 a capacity to reproduce these environments uh, uh, in other locations, to extract them from the natural uh, uh, context. Humboldt collected that of the humidity, of the temperature, of pressure, together with the logical conditions and the zoological particularities to demonstrate for the first time the existence of ecosystemic and climatic continuities across the world, as it was expressed in the previous 1823 chart of uh, isotherm lines, which shows regions with the same average temperatures on the world map. All these facts and knowledge produced by natural history and natural uh, scientists coalesced into a powerful idea the na that nature could be artificially produced and that the natural environment could be simulated for the Top, uh, tropical plants to endure. An architecture was set up to produce a new sort of botanical machines committed to the fabrication of sustained environmental conditions 
to cultivate and reproduce the species coming from other continents and climates, or I would say from other natural cultures. Is the case, for example, of these amazing uh, uh, species, the Victoria Amazonica, which is kind of a water lily, there was a gigantic water lily that uh, spread throughout the uh, 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 low waters of uh, uh, in, in, in Venezuela and Brazil, which uh, Europeans were obsessed with because they realized that uh, they could uh, they could bring them into England and Germany and France, which was, was, a, was a sort of a, a, a exotic plant, but they could not make them flower. They will not blossom here. So uh, these uh, uh, um, Victoria Amazonicas were brought again to England to this, into these botanic uh, machines and try to uh, uh, not just um, grow them, but actually reproduce them, get them to blossom. And that was one of the uh, uh, endeavors of Paxton also in uh, Chatsworth, uh, where he was the first one to, uh, he built another botanic uh, house, a greenhouse uh, for, uh, for his Victoria's Amazonicas that came from Kew Gardens and have them, he had them grow and finally blossom uh, in, 1947, in 18, sorry, 1847. And I, one of the most interesting things is that about the Victoria Amazonica is that when he turned them around, when he, they look why this huge surface of uh, vegetal surface could float on, on the water, they realized they had this amazing structure of, of, of ribs uh, of different scales that were hollow. So the air that was contained within the ribs made this, uh, 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 the weight, which is yeah, quite heavy, uh, 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 stand on, on the surface of the water, float on the surface of the water. And it is this model of, of, of the different scales of ribs and the uh, structure of the underside of the Victoria Amazonica, what many historians have claimed uh, was developed into the structural system for the uh, uh, Glass Palace in London uh, in the 1850s. But the purpose of these botanical machines were not ornamental or for the sheer botanical observation of natural diversity. They were inspired in a larger modern enterprise for economic progress and autonomy of supply. They were meant to adapt the palm trees and the rubber tree and other foreign species to the European climate, to transcript them into a built environment by unnatural means. So from the natural uh, 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 forest and the natural environment and the forests, uh, what forests in, in Venezuela and, and Ecuador to the uh, uh, botanic uh, machines in England uh, mediated by the text, the descriptions made by Humboldt and the other uh, uh, natural scientists. That was the transformation of nature through these different medias from its natural condition to its more artificial condition and maybe in between even more artificial if it could be uh, the one of the text, the one of the description. That was the case of another plant that was declared indispensable for the British Empire around 1850s, the Hevea brasiliensis or the weeping wood. A, a tall tropical tree that produces the milky natural liquid known as latex, with which natural rubber was produced, indispensable at the time for the new electrical technology in development, as for the railway steam engines. And the problem was that its supply was uncertain because it was controlled by the enemies of the empire. It was controlled by the Portuguese and by the Spaniards, etc. As the Hibea brasiliensis proved to be much more successful than the rubber trees that were produced in the East, in Asia, in 1876, the botanics, the botanist Robert Cross was sent by senior officials of the India office to Central and South America to collect the specimens and report to the requirements regarding climate and soil. The plants and seeds he brought back with him were acclimatized first in the Kew Garden glasshouse, you can see in the image at the uh, 
botanic gardens at Kew, the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, and soon distribute to the tropical colonies of Ceylon, India, and Malaysia. So the rubber tree coming from uh, Venezuela was taken to these sort of uh, uh, artificial environment in Kew Gardens in Richmond, north of England, north of London, where they were developed and acclimatized to, to these new latitude conditions and later on shipped to the uh, British uh, colonies in the east in order to produce rubber at the scale that could compete, that would uh, provide, would supply the necessities uh, of the empire with a full displacement of the natural environment from one continent to the opposite with one uh, sort of a, a step in between, which were these botanic machines, these environmental control botanical uh, uh, machines uh, in uh, the gardens of uh, Kew. For this wild plant of the Amazon jungles was tame, how this wild plant of the Amazon jungle was tame and trained to be the producer of the preeminently pre Asian cash, cash crop is one of the central narratives in the twist from natural history to botanical economy. A crucial episode in the narrative that in the transport of the Hevea seeds from Brazil into the Kew Gardens in England and then into the Southeast in an episode that shows which was the level of control over the natural or the extent of the artificial uh, uh, understanding of the natural at that point. You can understand that the difficulty uh, of the demands from creating an environmental condition like the tropical ones, like nine, over 90% humidity and over 80% centigrade all year through night and day was part of the uh, um, architectural problem that these botanical machines uh, are uh, try to resolve as much as the problem of uh, uh, light and heat, of natural light, which induced this idea of the glazing envelope for the whole uh, uh, building. This is the uh, uh, the palm house at Q nowadays, which has been restored to the pre-existing condition. Uh, it's quite interesting and you see in the green color of the glass, it's because in order to create the kind of light that was appropriate to the palm trees that were brought from, from uh, 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 South Africa and from, from America as well as in, uh, from Asia, uh, they realized that, uh, that if they uh, produce a uh, glass with a lot of iron in it, in the composition of the, of the, of the glass, they would produce a light that was more uh, adequate for the tropical plants uh, to endure and grow. This instrumental articulation of science and aesthetics, either in landscape painting, landscape design or architecture for the modeling of nature to make it less natural and more human offers another significant case study a hundred years later. The loss of confidence in technology after the end of the Second World War is strongly affected even engineering institutions like the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the MIT, maybe possibly for their participation in the nuclear development uh, uh, itself. But the fact is that in 1950s, in the 1950s, the MIT embarked in their laboratories and with their own state-of-the-art technology on another new attempt to connect nature through science. The former Bauhaus teacher and Gestalt, and Gestalt advocate, Georgi Kepes, was appointed by the MIT Architecture School to be in charge of the Visual Fundamental Program in 1946. And in coincidence with the new curriculum transformation introduced by the post-war institute directors in the 1950s, Yogi Kepes decided to reinforce the provision of a social agency to science through cognitive and perceptual technology. Once again, a cultural prog uh, program was constructed 
in order to bring together science and nature through aesthetics, similar, not that different, at least in character from Humboldt's interest in the description of nature as a coherent system through a unified image. That was one of the main purposes uh, for which Yori Kepes founded the Center for Advanced Visual Studies, the CAVS. The CAPS was organized as one of the inter interdisciplinary institutes within the MIT that took advantage of the defense spending privileges that blur boundaries among academic disciplines and between basic and applied research. Based on, based on interdisciplinary collaboration, the micro and micro visual technologies and the research and development at the MIT Science Labs were applied to the description, though this time just through the image, of the internal structure of the natural to discover the fundamental relevance of patterns as geometry and of the material media as light and as electricity, which induced the idea that nature had to be studied, the study or understood, not as object, but as process. The images produced at uh, CAPS by X-rays, the oscilloscope, the stroboscope like this one, uh, this stro stroboscope is, was an invention of this guy, Harold Edgerton in the 1930s. It was, is a, it's a high speed photograph system that allows to record movement and change in, in the sequence of images uh, without having to, uh, um, it's without having to uh, do anything to the, to, the, to the photograph itself. It's, a, it's, a, it's an alteration of, of a flash, of the light flash system that creates images every uh, one portion of a second. So uh, it takes so many pictures within a second that you could portray, you could uh, follow the changes over this uh, micro uh, uh, developments of time. Okay. So the images produced of calves by X-rays, the oscilloscope, the stroboscope, the radar images, the radiographs and the spectrographs recorded experimental data, exposing to vision, not for existing conditions, but outcomes of interventions open to constant alteration due to potential environmental changes. They capture diagrams of events rather than the description of things. However, the images produced by Georgi Kebis at Cubs were precise, uh, objective, literally insightful, and yet they were also unnatural. Not even supported on the natural capabilities of human vision, once again, but once again, under technological expansion of the new media. This is the final image. This is a, uh, this is a, uh, laboratory uh, 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 image of the section of a piece of wood uh, done with an a, a electronic microscope. Thank you. Thank uh, to you, Lisa. I would like to invite uh, the students to ask Luis some mm -hmm. questions. Um, in this case, Nobuyushi Yokota and Elsa Adui. Okay. Hey. Okay. Uh, thank you for your amazing speech. Uh, I was working in a Japanese architecture company. Uh, when I run an architecture in the nature and the landscape, uh, sometimes I see I don't need to make a survey here. Uh, do you have a uh, experiment? We cannot really understand. There's a lot of echo where you are. Uh, oh, it's because of me. Okay. Maybe Raja, you can mute yourself and uh, yeah. maybe, maybe you can repeat the question. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Can you, can you listen? Yes, this is much better. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, when I plan an uh, architecture in the nature and the landscape, 
uh, sometimes I think I don't need to make here. Uh, so do you have such an experience? And then also, would you tell us about the responsibilities and, uh, as architect? I, I, I'm, I'm really very sorry, but I, I cannot I cannot hear well enough to understand the question. Maybe somebody can read uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe. the question again, no. perhaps. I can hear. I can. I cannot hear him well enough to understand it. So I'm sorry. Okay, uh, it's fine. Um, Nobu's question was about the fact Maybe, that. Maybe uh, Nabilas, you can. Uh, you can write down. Um, you can write a question in, uh, so we can read it. Time. If you like, but I can read it. It's yeah. fine. I guess I can just say it. Yes. Thank you, Elsa. Of course. Um, Nobu was asking, uh, as an architect, if you okay. ever had a, a situation where you decided not to build on site, to preserve the site somehow, asking for the, the experience of choosing to work or not work in a field somehow. Well, uh... Well, I'm so, sorry. I, I couldn't. I couldn't understand at first. Uh, I couldn't hear at first. Uh, well, I it's, made it shorter though. Thank you. It's it's um. It's a it's a very interesting question because it's uh, part of the uh, um, research we're doing at the at the master program in Madrid, uh, or one of the ideas I'm trying to reinforce is 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 the uh, uh, the fact that we, we, as architects we we are taught. We are actually taught, and then we we tend to think, as a consequence of our uh, education, the education we receive that that we are in contact with things directly. That we, we we tend to talk about the context, the landscape, the environment, history, etc., like if they were things that we access, sort of directly, like almost in a natural way. So one of the points of, of, of talking about the unnatural quality of these botanic machines is to reinforce the idea that uh, uh, not just with, uh, in our relationship with nature, but with our relationship with the physical world and with the intellectual world, with history, for example, we uh, rely on uh, intermediate uh, uh, instruments. We, we, we relate on medias, on different media. Uh, being those medias, literal medias like photographs, being those medias are uh, more sophisticated ones like like the discourse of history or the discourse of contextualism or the model of organicism, like like the, the, the model of the structural model of nature being uh, one we can prefer to always because it's, it's unquestionable, uh, shows that in our education, we should, I believe, reinforce the, the concept of mediation, of using, uh, always using uh, uh, instruments of mediation in order to relate to other things. Even though uh, this seems to be like, like a more conceptual uh, argument or, or, or uh, a statement, what I would say is that even when we think we are talking about context or landscape or reality, the site of a building, we do so uh, uh, through mediating our uh, models. We do so through mediating concepts, and we do so through mediating discourses. Like, for example, I think that just the term context is a mediating concept itself, because we don't know what the concept, what the context is. A context mm -hmm. is a construction that describes something. What are the elements that we introduce into the concept of context of a particular site? It depend, depends on, on ourselves, depends on our education, on our culture, on our interest, on our uh, approach to architecture. So the idea of uh, insisting on the, the mediating devices, not just for representation, but for thinking, I think it's, it's pedagogically good because it shows that we don't relate to things directly, but through mediating devices. Thanks. Do you, do you think I have to have an, another questions? Yes, there is still time for another question. Okay, great. Well, you actually opened a door to that question in your answer to this previous one, but I was wondering about the, 
the historical status of the natural elements uh, and their evolution. Uh, regarding the protection of ecosystem, I think that unf unfortunately it's not in the end of uh, the gardener, the urbanist, nor the architect to actually make a big difference in terms of protection of those ecosystem. Uh, since, as far as I know, elements of nature don't have a legal status regarding the law. I mean, a river cannot attack in court a factory for polluting, for polluting it. So my question is, how do you see the evolution of the status of the element of nature in the, let's say, next 50, 100 years? Well, uh, thanks for the question. One, one of the uh, reasons I, ch I, I chose this, uh, uh, this approach to, to, to the brief of, of the conferences uh, stating, for the sake of the argument, that nature is part of heritage, okay? is part of history. Uh, it's precisely because, I, I, as you can imagine, right, as you are actually implying yourself, I guess, uh, that, uh, that nature is something uh, which we think we have to recover. So we have lost it. So it's, it's, it belongs to the past because it has been lost. It is a memory. And as I insist, as modern beings, the only way we talk about nature, we think about nature, is through these all these mediating uh, devices, either landscape painting or any other uh, descriptions of nature done by, uh, uh, for example, Humboldt when when he was one of the last ones that encountered uh, a real uh, natural environment, and that's in the 1850s or in the early 80s, uh, 18s. No? So. So for us, history, sorry, uh, nature is landscape and landscape is history. That as architects in the late 20th century, beginning of 21st century, uh, nature, it's already a human construct, like a, a completely artificial construct. Now, I think that uh, the, the uh, climate crisis uh, awareness in the last uh, uh, 10, 15 years, and, and I say awareness because the climate crisis comes from, from already the 1850s, uh, uh, has reproduced uh, 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 a concern over nature that reminds us that we actually think, it as, think about it as memory. And that's why I like the, the, the I recommend everybody to see over and over again uh, Spielberg's movie, uh, Jurassic Park. Uh, in Jurassic Park, there is a, there's an amazing book by this uh, uh, American scholar, uh, Svetlana Biom, that wrote a book called uh, uh, The Future of Memory. Um, in one of the first chapters, she talks about Jurassic Park uh, as a, a very significant uh, uh, demonstration that uh, we live in a world, in a culture in which there's no difference between future and past. No, this is this sort of a crumbling of the historical uh, uh, time development, uh, and now we know. Now we 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 use the the most amazing technology, as it happens in the movie, to produce not just a human past, but to produce a pre-human past, which is the a time in which humans were not on Earth, and it was taking over. It was it was the domain of the dinosaurs. Now the, the idea that. First of all, technology is not something that takes you towards the future, but towards the past. And there can be a time, even a past, in which humans were not part of it. I think it declares the, our, our uh, conflictive relationship, contemporary conflictive relationship with the concept of nature and the concept of history and time and, and, and future and past. So I think we have come to realize that if we want to deal with nature, if we want to recover nature, we have to reproduce again technologically nature because nature is already gone. We, it's like, like the, the dinosaurs at Jurassic Park were produced in a lab, like nature has to be recovered somehow through technological artificial media, like the British were doing with the uh, uh, tropical uh, uh, environments in their botanic houses, in botanic uh, uh, machines. Now, the the uh, uh, I think the first thing, the, the first step for anything relies uh, it's in education. So, as architects, as you say, we need to uh, I think become aware of the fact that when we talk about landscape, we're talking about a mediating device, a mediating instrument to deal with 
a cultural construct of nature that is not nature. Landscape is not nature. And, uh, and if we want to deal with nature, we have to do it through uh, um, a different approach. We have to uh, reconstruct, we have to become conscious again, or conscious, at least for once, that, uh, that we live in a world, we live in an environment which is fully human, and that nature has been expelled, evacuated many years ago. So we we'll have to redefine what nature is. About. Yes. And I think the concept of natural history, which I didn't have time enough to uh, make more reference to, it's a very significant one. You know, natural history is a, is a modern invention, like landscape, same time. And natural history, it's amazing because it's not a history of nature. It is the description of nature. It was, a, it was a sort of a science that was dedicated to the description of science, but again, through words and uh, drawings. So it was another way, like landscape, to turn nature into a discourse, a human discourse. So whenever we approach nature, we turn the human. So we have a problem. We have to think about. Thank you. Very much. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Yoshi and Elsa, for your very nice questions. Thank you, Luis, for your presentation. And thank you also for your considerate and comprehensive answers to the questions. Um,